So I wanted to start by just asking you a question to begin with. Has like life ratcheted up a notch? Do you feel that? Like life is ratcheting up a notch for everybody. There's everybody you know is going through some kind of transition, some kind of change, some kind of something. And I think it's as though the universe is saying the grace period is now over. You know, we have these tools, we have this God, we have this love, we have this genius, we know these things, we practice these things, and I think it's time we're being asked to truly live this. You know, I think for me, it's often a path of getting out of my head and being led. You know, really being led. And so, you know, sometimes when you're in uncertainty and you don't know the answers and you don't know what you're supposed to do and you're trying to figure it out, you're looking for answers outside you. And what I want you to know is that the path is already inside you. There is already a path in you. And that's where we're meant to go. And the spirit in us knows exactly what to do. But it's moment by moment. So what I want to talk about is then what stops us from listening to that inner voice. We all have access to this genius. We all have access to this love. We have access. We're meant to give these gifts we have. Many of you have dreams and a mission and a drive and something you're supposed to do here. What stops us from listening to that inner voice fully? And the one thing I know is if you're not listening to your heart or your soul or your guidance, then you are listening to somebody else. It's just that simple. You're either listening to your heart and your guidance, or you're listening to somebody else. And so I wonder, you know, it could be the voice of the media, it could be the voice of the culture, it could be the voice of education. For me, it was the voice of my mother. So, uh, you know, and many of you may know my story, you may have heard me speak, or you may have read my books, but I'm going to share a little bit of my personal story, because I believe we learn through stories. You know, I believe that stories are parables. I'm not saying that I'm biblical or anything, uh, though I might, who knows. Uh, but I think that each, my story is our stories, right? And so I knew when I was younger that I wanted to write. That was my dream. I, I, fe I fell in love with writing. I took a creative writing uh, class, and the creative writing teacher was gorgeous. So this was a sign. This was clear now. It was getting very clear. And so I went home to share this news with my family that I'd found my dream and my calling. But I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, to an Orthodox Jewish family. And let me tell you, if you come home and you say, I found my calling, I want to be a writer, nobody says Mazel Tov. <laughs> OK, nobody, right? You know, I basically could have said, I found my calling. I want to start a meth lab. It could have been the same thing, because in my mother's mind, you know, uh, taking drugs, selling your body to the night, and being creative, they're all the same people. <laughs> they're all the same people. They're all going to be living under the same bridge, let's face it. Really, let's be real. Uh, we'll be getting donations at least, that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so my mother said something like, you're going to write? You're going to write? You are going to starve, you're going to write. And that was the go for your dreams talk. <laughs> that was the extent of it. That was what I got. Um, and she said something like, you know, uh, you can't get a job and you'll write on Sundays, right? The reasonable path. And many of you have gotten the same advice, haven't you? Maybe different accent. Um, but. <laughs> But didn't we get the same advice that don't, don't be practical, be safe, don't listen to what's speaking to you, don't listen to what's moving you, don't listen to what spirit is whispering to you, don't listen to what feels good, be safe, be practical, be smaller. And I know that there is no safe path other than listening to your inner voice other than listening to your genius. That's what these uncertain times are for. There is no external path anymore. It's about listening to that internal path. That's what we're here to do. But I didn't know that back then, and I went off to law school, and I got accepted to Harvard Law School. I know people are pitying me already. Um, <laughs> I went to Harvard Law School, and I graduated with honors from Harvard Law School, and my mother was very, very proud. She was bragging in every synagogue for all she was worth. You know, my little girl, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> 
<laughs> again. <laughs> right? And I ended up on partnership track in a major law firm, and you may have had this situation in your life where your life looks a certain way. It looks right. Other people think you're doing the right thing. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but it doesn't feel right. It feels empty, or it feels scary, or it feels meaningless, or it feels too hard. And it's supposed to. I think we're supposed to feel that pain when we're not listening to our hearts, when we're not listening to our souls, when we're not listening to your particular genius, the only thing you have to give us. So thank God, I was really struggling at the time, and thank God a friend of mine said to me, think about it. If you've been this successful doing something you don't love, <laughs> what could you do with what you love? And that made sense. And that's what I want to know for us what could we each do with love? What could we do with what we love, right? In any part of our lives. And so uh, that was the beginning of my journey of thriving through uncertainty because I walked out of that law career without a plan, without resources, and I just thought, I'm gonna follow this inner voice and find out where it goes. So I wanna talk a little bit more about that because at this point I'm a coach and I work with artists and entrepreneurs and visionaries and change agents and anybody who pays me. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I get this question all the time, how do I do this? But how do I do this? What is the path? How do I do this? And we all want like a linear path, right? We all want the A to B to C to D. We want the three steps, the easy steps. And I don't believe it's that way. I, I don't believe this is a path where we figure it out from our minds. It's a path of letting it out. And what that means to me is, I teach all my clients this saying, um, and it's that you can't plan an inspired life. You can't plan an inspired life. We can't figure it out from our minds. It's inspired. It's bigger than us. That's why it feels scary to us, because we can't see where it's going to go or how it's going to work. But it's inspired. It's unimaginable good. That is what this path is. That is what this love is. But it demands that courage from us to follow that. So you can't plan this life, but you can follow it. You can follow it moment by moment by moment. And so I have a passage, I have a chapter in Thriving Through Uncertainty, my new book, where I talk about following the breadcrumbs. You know, because that's really what it is. It's like you'll get a breadcrumb, and it'll lead to another breadcrumb, and it'll lead to another breadcrumb, right? So how this worked for me is um, when I finally started writing my first book, it took me 12 years to write my first book. Um, and I know some of you are doing the math thinking, oh my God, I, I don't have that kind of time. Um, I'm done with this woman. And so, uh, but I always tell people, I think it took me 11 years to heal, 11 years to believe in myself, 11 years to dare something, 11 years to believe in this loving spirit, and one year to write a book. And so, if you feel like your life is all over the place or not happening, you know, or it's taking so long, it's because we're doing so much at the same time. We're doing so much. We're undoing a belief system. We're changing the way that we think. We're changing the way that we believe. We're going against the normal culture. It takes a while, but it's worth it. So anyways, I'm writing this book. It's taken me this while. And I finally think, OK, how do you publish it? How do you get it into the world? You know? And so I read about self-publishing and commercial publishing and all this stuff. And I hear an inner voice. And it says, just put it in the river. Just put it in the river. Isn't that beautiful? And what the hell does that mean? <laughs> really, what the hell does that mean? It's bad enough to have, you know, it's so hard to hear an inner voice as is, mind speaks in metaphors. Um, and I've, I've told this story, and actually some readers have said, well, maybe the voice meant put it on Amazon. And I thought, that's a good idea, right? So. But I knew intuitively it meant self-publish this book. Just, you know, self-publish the first book because get it out there some way, somehow. If it, get it into the stream of life. Put yourself out there some way, somehow. If it's supposed to go somewhere, it would. But it was really scary to follow that because I didn't know anything about marketing or distribution and you have to put your own money into this. So it's like so the wrong direction, you know. And have you ever had that? Like you get the guidance and you get the answer and it's like, can I get a second opinion? You know, like I really, I would like another one. One where I get money this time. Um, 
And so, <laughs> I want that one. Can I see that voice? Um, and so, anyways, I decide I'm going to follow this voice, though. I decide I'm going to follow it all the way. You know, I've gone this far. I am going to serve this voice. I'm going to see in my lifetime where it goes. And the second that you decide that you will follow your voice, the second you decide that you are going to take these instincts all the way, no matter what, the second you do that, you will meet the most judgmental person. In seconds, you will meet the most judgmental person. I don't know why, but you will. And so I don't know what made me do this, but I went to an ex-boyfriend's house for a Passover dinner. And I ended up sitting next to this woman who was my mother on steroids. <laughs> and all night, she's drinking this bad wine, all night. And she starts grilling me all night. And she starts going, so you're going to publish a book? And you know nothing about marketing. And you know nothing about distribution. And you're putting your own money into this? You are very ambitious. Right, which is code for you are a nut, you know, like step away from my kids immediately. Um, and, you know, I'd never gotten the Passover ceremony before. I'd done them, but I'd never gotten it before. I got the Passover service in a way that I had never, ever gotten it. The, all of a sudden, I got it. It was like, oh, let my people go. <laughs> I understood it now. Let my people go. You know, it's because I kept thinking, what do I tell this woman? Do I tell her, oh no, I have a plan. I'm going to put it in a river. <laughs> or do I tell her not to worry? I've been listening to an inner voice <laughs> for 12 years. It's very nice. Because, you know, you say these things here in rooms like this, and we love each other, and we get it, and it makes sense, and then you talk to normal people. My, then you go, go, you leave this room and you talk to normal people, not so much, right? And that is the work of what voice will you listen to? What voice will you listen to? Thank God I followed that voice and I finally got the guts and I self-published my book anyway. Uh, it started spreading through word of mouth. Um, it hit different bestseller lists locally. It was really amazing. It was just going through word of mouth. But then four months after I self-published, I got an email out of the blue that said, your fairy godmother has arrived. Your fairy godmother has arrived. Now, if you got an email like that, come on. Don't you think that's spam, right? You're going to think it's going to be Russian girls are waiting for you. <laughs> you know, right? There's money for you at Ni in Nairobi. Give us your credit card number immediately. <laughs> Some king wants to meet you, you know? I mean, just, you know, it would be that kind of thing. But I opened it up, and it was a vice president of marketing and publicity for Random House. And she, that was my reaction, too. It was like, <gasps> you know? And, and uh, she was in a career transition, and she was having a meltdown, and she somehow found my self-published book, somehow. And she said, I love this book. It is the best book I have ever read on finding your calling. I want to help you get it to a major New York publisher, which, yes, thank you. For me, that was like saying, I'm going to help you meet God, you know, the unthinkable, you know. And she got it to the publisher I'd always, always dreamed of. It was Tarcher, part of Penguin, Random House. Of She got it to the president of the company, um, and they bought it. They bought it, you know, they bought it. And not only did they buy it, they bought, they kept the exact same title, they didn't make me edit the book. I had to change maybe 10 sentences out of the whole book. I had self-published, and I didn't know what I was doing. And I love purple, so it had purple ink all over it, you know? Like, they kept the purple, you know? <laughs> and I, <laughs> thank you, the, the, the purple, that's what they're applauding. <laughs> that's what they're applauding. <laughs> you know, of, but as an unknown writer, I would never have started off that way had I followed a conventional path. If I had followed the traditional path and done what you're supposed to do, I would never ever have ended up that way. And that's what I mean when I say that you can't plan an inspired life. You can't plan an inspired life. You're, you know, how am I gonna have this thought that, okay, I'm gonna have a meltdown for 12 years, this other woman's going to have a meltdown at the end of 12 years. We're going to hook up, and that's my business plan. <laughs> that's my business plan. That's what I've got. What bank is going to go? Sounds great to us, Ms. Caves. 
excellent. But that's the thing, there is a plan. You may not be able to see it, but there is a plan in all of us, moment by moment, if we listen to this extraordinary voice, and these are times in the world when we need you listening to your extraordinary voice, and we need you following that, right? And so, I used to always end with that story because it's such a great story, but you know how like it is that we're always trying to get there? We're just trying to get there. If, when the check comes in, I'll be okay. When I meet the love of my life, I'll be okay. When I lose 10 pounds, I'll be okay. When I can divorce the love of my life, I'll be okay. Uh, whatever it is. When I get the new church and the new center, I'll be okay. Right? We're always putting it over there. And thriving through uncertainty is about being here. Because life is uncertainty. Life is growth. Life is shifting. Always. It's, there's no there there, right? And so... Um, I use this analogy in my book, Thriving Through Uncertainty, of almost as though we're playing this great video game. And it's almost, have you ever, ever had the experience where you're dealing with an issue and you're dealing with an issue, one of your issues, and you finally make some progress, and then at some other point you're dealing with the same exact issue? Have you had that experience? Please tell me you've had that experience. Okay, thank you. Thought it was just me, because I'll think, Really, are you kidding me? I am dealing with this fear again? Like I have not had enough therapy already for this issue? Come on! You know, but that's what the video game is, is that we hit a certain level, we do really well, and then the rules change. You get to the next level, and now the enemies are sneakier. Right? They, first they act nice to you, you know, or the rules change, or you don't know how to win anymore, or all the tools that you know how to survive don't work as well anymore. If that's what's going on, that's the video game. You're at a next level. You're growing. You're not broken. You're not failing. We're not falling behind. It's expansion. It's like, can we use our tools here? Can we choose love now? We chose it over there. Can we do it over here? So how this worked for me is um, when I was publishing my second book, Inspired and Unstoppable, uh, right when that book was coming out, I had a lot of hard things going on personally. My partner got really sick, and I didn't have help in my business, and I had like all these possible opportunities, and I couldn't follow up with things, and all the stuff you think about, I should do this, I have to do that, and the lists you write, and I couldn't keep up with anything, and I was really, really getting upset and freaking out and feeling overwhelmed, which is so attractive attractive in a self-help author, by the way. So attractive in a self-help author of somebody who's written a book inspired and unstoppable. Really, really, you know, I'm like, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you know. So one of my friends said, okay, that's enough, honey. That's enough, honey. We got to get you to a healer. You know, like, that's enough. We got to get you out of your head. You're overwhelmed. You're going to this healer. So I agree, fine. I don't know anything about this woman. You know how, like, it's like when you're hurting, it's like, fine, I'll do anything. Don't know anything about this woman. I have to go visit her in a yurt. In a yurt. I didn't even know what a yurt was. A yurt is a tent, right? So I'm visiting this woman in the yurt, and um, she asks me in this nice, soft, sweet healer's voice, so what would you like to shift? What would you like to see differently? And when I'm scared out of my mind, I'm in my New York City mode, and I'm speaking fast, and I'm like, and this, and that, and that, and this, and that. And I'm, she goes white, you know, and I think she's probably thinking, there's not enough sage in the world. <laughs> There is clearly not enough sage in the world to cleanse this space now. It's over. Oh my God. So she immediately says, okay, we're gonna do a ritual. Let's get you out of here, right? And so she takes me, she has a stream that's on her property and she takes me to this stream and she makes me stand in it and she has me face downstream and all the water's rushing past and rushing past and rushing past and she starts telling me, those are all the opportunities you've blown, all the things you didn't do and things that didn't work and all the reasons you tell yourself if, you know, I'm too old or I'm too young or I don't have the credentials and it's all rushing by and think, oh, I didn't do that and oh, I didn't get that done. It's too late, too late. It's gone. And so she starts telling me, remember that creative idea you were going to do? Didn't do it. There it goes. But somebody else is making a million dollars now. It's like, no, no, no. You know, I'm practically throwing myself in there. Um, and she finally asks me, what are you feeling right now? And I tell her, I'm out of control. It's going too fast. I, I don't feel like I'm in control. I don't feel like I'm in control. And then I finally realized I'm not in control. I'm not in control. And what I finally realized was all I could do 
was what I could do. That's all I could do. And it was just this moment of self-forgiveness because we're in our heads telling ourselves, you should do this and you should do that and you should have done this and you should have done that. And it was just this thing of the self-forgiveness of being here. And then she had me turn around and face the stream coming at me and all the water that was coming at me and it was bubbling and splashing and whatever. And she said, these are the chances that life is still giving you. You know, here's another opportunity, and here's another chance, and life is giving you love, and life is showing up in love, and there's so much coming at you, and there's more, and there's more, and it's never, ever going to stop, right? And what I, what I learned in that was realizing that the past does not create the future. The past does not create the future. I was so busy looking at all I hadn't done and all I wasn't and all I wasn't accomplishing that I wasn't available to what my life was offering me now and the chances that were showing up now. And what I learned is the past doesn't create the future, the present does. That's where we thrive. That is the only moment we have, right? The present is where it happens. And what I also learned is that when I'm in the present, that's when I feel the presence. That's when I feel the presence, and in that presence, I can choose again. I can choose now. Instead of telling myself story after story about what I haven't been, what I didn't do, what didn't work, I can choose now, and I can choose love, and I can choose to begin again, and to choose to begin again, because life is always going to come at me. And so that's what thriving is to me, and what I'd like you to think about today for the rest of the day. Where have you told yourself you can't have something, or it won't work, or a dream, or an idea of what you want, or anything in your life, whether it's health, relationship, business, anything? Where have you written something off? Maybe this is your chance to dare to believe again and to dare to choose again, and to dare to love again. Because I believe that's what we're here learning. That's what the video game is, right? So I'm gonna read you a passage uh, from Thriving Through Uncertainty. It talks a little bit about this video game concept. And um, I talk about A Course in Miracles has a line that says, who you think you are is a belief to be undone. Who you think you are is a belief to be undone. And what that means is all the limits we tell ourselves and all what we can't have and should have and would have done, all of that is a belief to be undone because it's another choice to dare to believe in that power that's in you and that love that's in you and that love that's in all of us. And I deeply believe that that's what uncertainty is for, that we are all now being asked to be vehicles and vessels of that love in this world at this time, right? So I'm going to read this to you. And it's about practice and showing up again. A Course in Miracles teaches that who you think you are is a belief to be undone. You think you can be stopped. You think you can be diminished. You think you can fail. But that's the game. You can never lose. You already have everything you need. You have this crazy alchemical love within you, and it's yours to give in any situation, which changes every situation, and even changes you as you give it. You do not walk alone. Will you choose to listen to the disconnected smallest version of yourself or the highest allegiance of your spirit? You have a choice. Choose love. Choose again. Choose now. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. By the way, my mother used to always say whenever there was a problem, did I need this? And apparently we did. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.